Hi, I'm Pethorn Dawkins. Welcome to Schools Not Out, your daily classroom for CSEC and CAPE students. You can watch this lesson real time on Television Jamaica's YouTube channel or One Spot Media. We're also live on Music99 and GoJamaica.com. If you have any questions on today's subject, you can send them in to Television Jamaica's Facebook page or Instagram at Television underscore Jamaica. Today's lesson is CSEC Physics. Alright, good morning students. Welcome back. All right, we're going to do something. I believe that especially the exit students, fifth form students will appreciate. We'll be looking at some multiple choice questions. Yes, I have compiled um, some recent multiple choice questions for us to look at. And uh, owing to the whole COVID thing and the adjustment in the status quo as to how questions are, um, exams are administered, then it is prudent that we would look at what you will actually be looking at in your exams, which are the multiple choice questions. So let's get right into it. Now, with the, any multiple choice question that you have, you know you have four possible options. There are some that distract you and they may send something close to it. And then there's, there should, of course, be the correct answer. So with any multiple choice that you approach in your exams, don't freak out, don't anticipate the worst. Read your questions carefully. Look at all responses possible. And when you have selected the, the correct answer in your mind, ensure that every other one could not possibly be as close to that answer as the one you have selected. All right, so basically, trial and error, but with caution and with consideration. All right, so for the first question, the SI unit of temperature is, and there are four responses, Celsius, Fahrenheit, Kelvin, and centigrade. Now, in terms of the SI, the term SI there is very important because it speaks to know what is the agreed universal unit for temperature. Now, you should already know that Celsius is a unit of temperature, Fahrenheit is one, and you may even come across a centigrade. But when it comes down to the SI unit of temperature, it is really the Kelvin, which is C, that you should select here. All right, because when you're given your list of fundamental quantities, you should have been given the Kelvin. It's an absolute temperature value. All else are relative scales. Number two, this refers to the following graph. Item two. Now it shows um, a sinusoidal graph of a transverse wave, and it asks a question. Which of the following two pairs of points are in phase? Now, when you're dealing with a wave that is in phase, it basically speaks about two points along the wave that are doing the same thing at the same time. And you know that with a transverse wave, the particles oscillate up and down. So if you're in phase, it means that any two particles, whether they're two next to each other as in consecutive or any two along the wave, they should be doing the same thing at the same time. So if you have one point going up, then you should have that next point that is in phase doing the same thing, which is going up. So when you look at this wave particles, and the pattern here just shows really what the wave, um, the particles position is from the rest point. So when you look at the possible answers, Y and W, let's look at Y and W. This shows here that this is a crest, and we'll get to that later. It's going up, W is going down. So they're going in opposite direction. So therefore, they're not in phase, all right? When you look at P and R, this one's going up, this one's at the rest position. That's not in phase either. When you look at S and W, S, W, yes. When you look at both of those um, particles there, uh, we realize that S and W here is not in phase either. And when you look at S and T, realize that those are not in phase so really there's a typo here when it comes on to them being in phase but the two particles that would actually be in phase would like be r and t those two are in phase p and y those two are in phase so the correct answer here is a type um, missing being missing is a type of error but just know that this particle and that particle are in phase that particle and that particle are in phase but the correct answer is not given there all right so we'll move on Given that force is equal to mass times acceleration, the unit of force could be written as... No, the unit of mass, you should know, is kilogram. 
unit of acceleration is mass uh, meters per second squared. So when you look at all the units here, this is per kilogram, the minus one indicates per kilogram, so you know automatically that's not right. When you look at this one, the kilogram is there, but this says per meter. So once you look at that now, you should also know that that isn't correct. Look at this one, this one looks close. Kilogram is for mass, meters second squared, acceleration, no, it is meters per second squared. So when you see an exponent, a number to the top, and you see a negative there, that indicates that it is per. So the correct answer there would actually be D. Moving on, linear momentum. Now this is just a definition. This is something that you should know. Is it the product of mass and acceleration? No, we looked at that as being force. So that's out. It is, is it the product of mass and velocity? Yes, it is. Uh, for C and D measured in Newton meters, no. Measured in kilograms per meter, no. So those are way out. In terms of the definition, the definition of linear momentum would actually give you the answer, which would be C there. Moving on to number five. It refers to the following diagram showing forces X and Y applied to an object. What should be the magnitude and direction of a third force, which will cause the object to remain stationary? Now, from the lesson that we looked at two weeks ago, we did forces, and if you remember anything about forces, you should know that forces must balance for objects to remain stationary. So if you have an X and Y force acting the same way to get this object to remain stationary, you must have the total of what X and Y is, and it must be act acting in the opposite direction. So when we look at the answers, X minus Y to the left, yes, it should be acting to the left, because if you look at the screen, that would be your to your left. So, but it is not X minus Y. It has to be the sum of the two. So right there and then, basically you can see that the answer there would be X plus Y. And it won't be to the right because X and Y are already pointing to the right. So you, you can eliminate C and D by the mere fact that they're saying that to balance these forces, you must be pointing to the right. But to balance it in truth, you need a left acting force. When a force is applied to a spring of original length L, and these are some times when CXC tries to test your, your logic and reasoning because they don't really have numbers, the new length becomes L plus X, and X of course is the extension. What would be the new length of the spring if the force F divided by 2 was applied instead? Now here's where we have to do a little bit of reasoning. This is coming from Hooke's law, which says that force is proportional to x, right? So if you have a force producing x of which has been produced, then if you make the force half as much, then that of course is proportional to the extension being half as much, all right? So you should have a situation where you have L being added to not x as it was before, but x over two. So based off that, you see A is out, B is out, C is also out, it's close, but it's out, so the answer there would have to be D. We move on. Item seven refers to the following diagram which shows three forces of magnitudes L, M, and N all in the same plane applied to a ring. Now when you're dealing with planar, coplanar forces, you should understand that this is not a three-dimensional diagram, all right? It is not vertical, horizontal, and in or out of the board, no. It is in one plane, so one points this way, one points that way, and one points that way. That's what they mean by coplanar or planar forces, forces in a plane. Now, which of the following equations must be true in order for the ring to remain stationary? Remember, if something is being acted upon by forces and it needs to remain stationary, what needs to happen? The forces acting must balance. Now, here's the reasoning behind this. L and M are perpendicular to each other and if you remember vectors you would know that L and M the total or the resultant of these vectors forces can be found using Pythagoras' theorem because once you have two sides of a right angle triangle to find the hypotenuse you know that you can use Pythagoras just a quick refresher if you have this vector and that vector, you can complete the vector diagram as such. And then the resultant would lie right in the middle like that. 
right? And then of course, this is a right angle, that is a right angle. So you can find the result and using that. And if you recall from Pythagoras' theorem, uh, it is the square of one side added to the square of the other side, and that's equal to the square of the hypotenuse. So really and truly, L squared plus M squared would give you its resultant. But the resultant of these two must balance N. So therefore, N being present, squared must be equal to L squared plus M squared. Because remember, N is being balanced by the resultant of these two. So if this is being balanced by the resultant, then this essentially is the resultant. Make sense? Hope it did. So therefore, it is N squared is equal to L squared plus M squared. Alright, as I said, they don't always send um, questions with values in it for you to calculate. Sometimes there's a reasoning that you have to do. Moving on. I iterate to first to the following graph which shows how the displacement of a runner from a starting line varies with time. So we have a displacement. So when you're dealing with motion graphs, displacement time, velocity time, you must look at what the vertical axis is depicting. And here we have displacement and time. Now a displacement time graph tells you the state of velocity. If you have a flat line, nothing is moving because the displacement is not changing. If you have a gradient, then it's either increasing in one direction or increasing in a negative direction. All right, or it is going slowing down. So from this, what can be deduced? Is the object person not moving? No, because its displacement is changing as you increase in time. It's going at a steady speed. It looks that way because if you look at after 50 seconds, you hit 12 meters. After 100 seconds, you hit twice as much, 24 meters. It is not going faster and faster because if you are going faster, you'll be covering more and more distance over the same time. So if after 50, you cover that, after 50 more, you cover more than what you covered in the 50. And it's not going slow and slower either. All right? Because that would be a curve. It would actually curve with regards to this type of graph. So the mere fact that you have equal changes of distance with equal changes of time, the speed is steady. So the answer there would be B. Moment of a force, another definition that you would need to answer this question. Moment of a force may be defined as moment in time. No, let's just throw that out right now because that's not what we're talking about. The length of time, no. So when it, once you start talking about time for moment, because they're going to like make it look like English than physics. So when they talk about moment, don't think about time. Think about what C says. The product of the force and its perpendicular distance from the turning point to the force. And if you don't remember what moments are all about, think of a spanner. When you want to loosen or tighten a bolt, you use a spanner. If the bolt is giving you trouble, what do you do? You either apply a greater force or you extend your distance from which you are applying the force. So you get a longer spanner, you get something to extend it. Either way, that creates a greater turning effect, which is a moment. So when you're dealing with moments, it is the product of force and its perpendicular distance from the turning point, which is basically the pivot. And it's not a ratio of force, all right? Ratio means it divides. Moment, you have to multiply force and distance. A block is allowed to fall freely towards the ground. As it falls, is gravitational potential energy. Now, anything that is above the surface of the Earth is considered to have potential energy by gravity. That's why they say gravitational potential energy. Now, if you allow it to fall, uh, in terms of increasing, it might increase, but if it's falling freely, it won't increase. All right? Because the higher up you are, the more potential you energy you have. So at the highest point, maximum potential energy. So it won't increase going down. All right, it'll actually be lost. So it can't be A and it won't be B. Because as I said, once it's falling, you're losing potential energy because you're losing height. It's converted to internal energy. Internal energy means that it's something stored within the body. No, you're losing it. So it's nothing increasing, nothing remaining the same, nothing being stored. So therefore, it is converted to kinetic energy. And kinetic energy is basically energy associated with motion. So if you know about the conservation principle, you know that potential goes to kinetic and vice versa. Number 11. Two smooth spheres, A and B, collide head-on. Which of the following statements is or are true? Momentum of A is the same 
after the collision as it was before. You cannot determine that by just reading that, all right? Because the momentum of an object determines by its mass and its velocity. You can't know what happens before and after by just looking at the one object. You have to look at both. So therefore, A is not true. And if you read B, momentum will be the same after collision as it was before. It's the same problem. You can't just look at one object. During a collision, you have to look at both. So therefore, one and two are out. So therefore, you're left with the total momentum of A and B is the same after the collision as it was before. And if you remember the conservation of linear momentum principle, which we did two weeks ago, you would know that this is true. So therefore, the only answer there is B, which is three alone. Item 12. First to the following diagram, it shows two vectors of magnitudes A and B represented by OA and OB. So that's OA, that's OB. The vectors act at a point O and are directly perpendicular to each other. Remember the perpendicular vectors that we were talking about? Pythagoras, right. Which of the following pairs represents both the magnitude and direction of the resultant? All right. So when you look at OA and OB, coming back to this diagram, OA points this way. Can I just label it right here? OB is that way. And then C is, of course, up here. So you can know, based on the diagram here, you can complete this point in that way, all right? So that's your vector diagram. That's your accurate vector diagram. So from this vector diagram, you can see that OC, O to C is the direction that it points. So based off that, A, B, and C are out, all right? Because you can't be pointing from C to O. That's what this means. C to O, C to O. No, that's out. So we eliminated those automatically. So we're left with A or B, A or D rather. But remember, when you're dealing with vectors that are perpendicular, it is, of course, Pythagoras. And when you're dealing with Pythagoras, we say OC, which is the resultant, is equal to OA squared plus OB squared. But that's not what's there, is it? No. Well, it's there, but it won't be correct. Because if you want to find this, you'd have to get rid of the square. So OC is actually the square root of OA squared plus OB squared. So the answer there is D. As I said before, you know, sometimes C could send questions and they are close. But you have to know what you're doing, work it out fully to get the correct answer. Because you could have jumped and said, all right, A is the correct thing. No, you have to square root to get the magnitude of the resultant. Height of a liquid in a vessel is H and its density is rho. Looks like a P, but it's actually rho, symbol for density. If the atmospheric pressure is x and the acceleration due to gravity is g, what is the pressure on the base of the vessel? Now, if you recall from pressure, pressure is talking about force over area, but when you're dealing with a liquid, you must recall the equation for pressure of a fluid, and that equation is rho, g, and h. These are things that you are expected to know, all right? So we can see here rho, g, and h together, but what's with this bracket? Let's figure out why they put the brackets there. Atmospheric pressure is x, and the total pressure on any object is due to atmosphere and any liquid pressure present. So therefore, the atmospheric pressure stands by itself as x. And that must, of course, be added to the fluid pressure that is present, which is, of course, rho, g, and h. All right? So the answer there is the atmospheric pressure added to the, mul the multiplication of h, rho, and g. It doesn't matter. 2 times 4 is the same thing as 4 times 2. So the answer there would be c. It won't be a, it won't be b, and it won't be um, d, because these indicate that these are added together before they're multiplied. So that's off. All right, so the answer there is C. Moving on. The specific latent heat of vaporization of water is 2.26 times 10 to the 6. When 0.01 kilograms of water is converted to steam, first of all, when something is converted to steam, the question is asked, does it absorb heat? Does it give off heat? The answer is, converting water to steam means that water absorbs the heat energy gets the energy to um, be released from the water surface and goes. 
So therefore, the first reasoning, is it absorbed or given out? Answer is that it is absorbed. The second answer and the second part of the question is now how much heat energy is absorbed? And the answer there is based on the equation ML and that's V. So that's 0 0.01 kgs times 2.26 times 10 to the 6. And when that works out, it's the same thing as 1 kilogram times 2.26 times 10 to the 4. And you can see the answer coming out there. So it absorbs 2.26 times 10 to the 4 joules of heat energy. All right, some persons may just jump and say this, um, number A, uh, part A rather, or answer A, but you must understand that the mass is 0 0.01, and when you reduce, when you increase this, this is reduced. So this and that are the same, so that's how that would be worked out. The energy required to change the state of a substance was determined to be EH. If the mass of the substance was doubled, the value of EH would be, going back to the equation, EH. Now this EH is talking about heat capacity. And if you recall the equation for heat capacity, it is that. But they're talking about two things, energy and mass. So since that is the case, we're just going to highlight those two. And based off the equation, energy and mass are directly proportional. And if you recall the lesson about proportionality that we did, if you double one, the other one will have to double, of course. So if you double the mass, M is being doubled, Therefore, EH will also be needed to be doubled if you want to keep everything constant. So the answer there would be B. Which of the following statements is false? Evaporation occurs at room temperature only. Evaporation requires heat energy causing cooling. We're looking at a false statement. So let's just find the correct ones first. Evaporation occurs at room temperature only. No. Evaporation requires heat energy and causes cooling. Yes. Your body um, uses evaporation of sweat to cool you down. Evaporation occurs only at the surface, that is true. It don't occur within the liquid. In evaporation, faster molecules escape the liquid. So B, C and D are all correct. Only A is false. Specific latent heat of fusion of water is that value. 340 joules per gram. And this is another part that I need for you to pay attention to the units that they give you. Because if you do not pay attention to the units, your math will be incorrect. So, let us look at that. You're given specific latent heat as being joule per gram. However, you're given mass in kilograms. So what do we do? One of the two things. Is either we convert mass in kilograms to grams, work it out, and then convert it back to joules. Or we convert the latent heat constant to joule per kilogram. So latent heat of fusion is 340 joule per gram. So if it is 340 per gram, then therefore to get the kilogram, we'd have to multiply this by a thousand because a thousand grams make a kilogram. So the conversion here is 340,000 joules per kilogram. All right. So if it is this needed for one gram, then it's a thousand more needed for the kilogram. And from that, we can work out what the energy is. The same thing that we looked at earlier on, which is mass times L, but in this case it's F. So that's 340,000 joule per kilogram. And that works out to be 3400,000 joules. However, they have given it in kilojoules. So to move from a small unit to a larger one, we have to divide. You have to brush up on your conversions if you're not following with this. So from before, we move from a small to a large, you multiply. For this one, we move from a large to a small. So if this is 3.4 million joules, to get it to kilojoules, we'd have to get rid of those zeros. So that gives us 3,400 kilojoules. All right? And the answer there would, of course, be either C or D. But the question is, when you're going, when you're freezing water, what happens? Is it the case that the water loses heat or it gains heat? Of course, you know that if you touch ice, your hand feels cold. Why? Because heat flows from your hand to the ice. And if heat is flowing from your hand to the ice, therefore, the ice is absorbing the heat energy. Make sense? So therefore, the ice 
would have to uh, give off the heat energy to get cooler. Because if it's melting, it's going to absorb. So when it's freezing, it gives off the heat energy, which therefore is D. Most refrigerators are painted white because a white surface is. And that's a good question. Why is it that they paint the refrigerators white? Purpose of a refrigerator keeps things cool. For you to keep things cool, it means that in terms of heat, you must not be absorbing a lot of heat energy. And when you are cool, you must not be giving off the heat energy. Well, the rule is good absorbers are good emitters. Poor absorbers are poor emitters. So, if it's a good reflector of thermal radiation, it is also a good absorber of thermal radiation. So therefore, it cannot be B or C, and it's not A. That's just put in there for, 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 for distraction. So it is not a good absorber of thermal radiation because a good absorber is also a good reflector or emitter. So therefore, the answer there would be D. It is a poor reflector of thermal radiation. Therefore, anything inside that is cool is kept cool for longer. Heat from a nearby fire reaches us mainly by, uh, well, I can just jump and tell you right now, it's going to be radiation. Why is not conduction or convection? In terms of conduction, you need a material medium. Between you and a flame is mainly atmosphere, and the atmosphere is a poor conductor. So if you feel really hot, it's not because of heat flowing via conduction, nor is it via convection. Convection causes air to rise, and it's not due to absorption. Because the only three methods are due to conduction, convection, and radiation. Which of the following is the poorest conductor of thermal energy? Air, copper, mercury, aluminum. Now this should be an easy one. If you're dealing with poor conductor of thermal energy, experience tells you that metals are very good in, ter in terms of conducting energy. So therefore, air would have to be the answer. If you have any questions about what we've done so far, you can send them in, in on our various platforms and I will see if I can answer them in the final segment. When you come back, answers to the questions and a recap. Stay tuned. Left you out, it's get moving kids. Home workout series with Jamaica Moves. Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays at 2 p.m. on TVJ. Hi! Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for Reduce your risk of viral illnesses like the flu and coronavirus. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water. Cover your nose and mouth when coughing with a tissue and dispose of it. Avoid close contact with anyone with the cold or flu-like symptoms. If you become ill, please visit your doctor or the nearest health center and share your travel history. The flu and coronavirus can kill. Let's protect each other. A message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching. COVID-19 tip. Protect yourself and others from getting sick by washing your hands after coughing or sneezing when caring for the sick before, during and after you prepare food before eating, after toilet use, when hands are visibly dirty, and after handling animals or animal waste. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching. Reduce your risk of viral illnesses like the flu and coronavirus. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water. Cover your nose and mouth when coughing with a tissue and dispose of it. Avoid close contact with anyone with the cold or flu-like symptoms. If you become ill, please visit your doctor or the nearest health center and share your travel history. The flu and coronavirus can kill. Let's protect each other. A message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness.
Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel to see our latest videos and also to see my channel. Welcome back to Schools Not Out, your daily classroom for CSEC and CAPE subjects. Today we've been discussing physics, CSEC multiple choice questions. All right, so we stopped at, I guess, 20 questions so far. I'm going to just go right back into it. 21, which of the following descriptions refer to both a good absorber and a good emitter of thermal heat energy? Now, as I was saying to you, a good absorber is a good emitter of thermal heat or radiation. A polished concave metal plate. The rule is, once you absorb well, you emit well. But something that's polished does not absorb very well because it's shiny. Anything that's incident or hits it is easily reflected. So A is out. And also B is out because it says polish as well. A flat polish. So then kind of give themselves that so when they talk about polished. So A, B and C are out by virtue of them using the terms polished. So it is a flat metal plate painted black. And when you talk about black, and you talk about black body radiation, yeah. And persons from experience would know that anything that's painted black or usually black gets or runs hot a lot. Alright? So for persons who think their car is dark during the summer, I'm sorry for you. Which of the following diagrams best describes or best represents the wave generated in a ripple tank by a small spherical dipper? vibrating at a constant frequency. Now, a dipper is basically a sphere attached to something that is oscillating and it's hitting the water surface. Now, from experience, if you throw a, pe um, a pebble or anything inside of still water, the water will generate water waves that will ripple outwards from wherever you touch. And the ripples will travel at the same speed in equal directions, in all directions. So from that, B and C are automatically out because it shows that there is some sort of bias, this moving faster than there. No, that's not what happens. Now it's down to A and C. But the problem with C is that it shows that the waves seemingly becoming faster as they move out. No, they move at the same speed because they're vibrating at a constant frequency. So by elimination, B, C and D are out. So the answer there would be A. This is definition, this is something that you should know as a physics student as you have done waves and optics. The range of frequencies detectable by the normal human ear. Uh, it is not, oh, I was going to tell you, B. If you didn't know, it is. 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Anything below that is not detectable by your human ear. Anything above that is considered ultrasound and yeah, your ears can't detect it. But uh, as you age, this range will narrow down because your ears are not as sensitive when you get older. But just know, average 20 hertz to 20,000 um, hertz, 20 kilohertz. The first to the following diagram which illustrates a side view of a water wave. Now this shows displacement, that shows the distance from one point to the next. Now the ask, the amplitude of the wave. Amplitude is determined by from rest position to the maximum point that the wave would displace a particle. So they have given you an 8 centimeter gap from peak to peak or tr um, crest to trough. But the amplitude is not the 8 centimeters as they have highlighted here, no. It is actually from the rest position to either the peak crest or the peak trough. So since 8 is the full peak to peak, then half of that will be the amplitude, which is of course 4 being A. An object is viewed in a plane mirror PQ. PQ is going across there. Which of the following diagrams correctly shows the formation of an image? Now an image is basically what you perceive in a reflective or a transparent material. Mirror being reflective. So, really and truly, when you see images in a mirror, it's as a result of light rays coming from the object, hitting the mirror, coming to your eyes. And in your eyes now, which interpret light as traveling in a straight line, will see the image behind the mirror. So, I, 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 all behind the mirror. So, what's the problem then? Rules of reflection must apply. And of course, rules of rays. Rules of reflection state that the angle of incident equals the angle of reflection. So when you put the angle here and here, that looks equal, that looks somewhat equal, that looks equal, that's not equal. So what else is it that we, we can use? 
Rays, light always travels from the object to your eyes. So it can't be this. We already eliminated this because the angle is not right. And we see here that it's either this or that. Because both of these are close. But the real distinction here is how light indeed travels. Light travels from the object, the real object, to your eyes. It doesn't travel from the image. So this diagram is showing you light as if it is coming from the image. No, it is coming from the object, it reflects from the mirror, and then comes to your eyes. These dotted lines are just what you perceive as being the image, not real, inside the mirror. All right, so the answer there, it should have been A, B, C, D, but it's the top left corner answer. Item 26 refers to the following diagram, an object OB standing on the axis of a converging lens L, which would be here, all right? So, IM represents the image formed, which would be this. It's not labeled properly, but this is the image, that's the object. The lens is placed 50 centimeter at the 50 centimeter mark of the scale marked every 10, 10 centimeters. So the lens is here, OB the object is here, IM is the image over there. The focal length of the lens is, this is a workout. Now if you recall from optics, you should know what relates focal length, image and object. One over F is equal to one over U plus one over V, where F is the focal length, U is the object distance, our height, sometimes they refer to it as height, but in this case it's distance, and V is the image distance, or in another case height. But since we're dealing with distance away from the lens, we're not concerned with height, we're only concerned with distance. Now, how does this work out? We know the object distance, because it is a scale diagram, so from 50 to 30, the object distance would be the difference of 50 and 30, which is 20. And that's added to, from 50 to 110, quick math, that's what, 60? All right, now if you have fractions and you added, LCM, 60, 20 goes into 60, 60 into 60, 20 into 60 goes what, three times, 60 into 60, that's one. So we have a situation here where one over F is four over 60, that reduced to its simplest form is 1 over 15, and therefore F corresponds to 15. So the answer there would be A. A ray of light enters a transparent glass prism. In which of the following diagrams is the dispersion of light correctly illustrated? Now, if you have ever wondered about the phenomenon of rainbows, it's as a result of the sunlight being refracted, bent, as it passes through water droplets. So no, it's not any leprechaun or any person with a pot of gold, no. It's really the science of light being refracted and dispersed. Now, light has seven component colors, Roy G. Biv, or V I B G Y O R, whichever we want to call it. But the question is asked now, how would it correctly be refracted? Now, the rule is, once something is being bent, it results in a change of speed and therefore uh, an adjustment in the wavelength and all of that. Because of how the spectrum is, violet, violet, violet as in V, has the shortest wavelength, so it will be deviated the least. Red having the longer, longest wavelength will be deviated the most. So when you look at light traveling, it will split apart first, split apart first. It won't pass into this and then go on the other side and then split. So it's not this or that. So it's either Roy G. Biv going down or V I B G Y O R going down. But as I said, violet has in, having the shortest wavelength is deviated the least. Red having the short longest wavelength is deviated the most. So therefore, the answer would be C. All right. Which of the diagrams best show the path taken by a ray of light passing through a rectangular block? Just as I said, when you look at the diagram here, you have refraction and then another state of refraction. So there's a double refraction. But for this, what happens is that once you have light coming through a material 
and the boundaries. Boundary, this is usually assumed as air, glass, glass to air. When the boundaries are parallel, the light goes in, is refracted, and when it comes back out through the parallel boundary, it is refracted in such a fashion that will produce the light coming out parallel to where it was going. So if it goes in and it bends, when it comes back out, it bends in such a way that it is parallel to when it went um, before it went into the block. So therefore, if you know that, it might look like this, but it's actually this. It's not this, it's not that. It has to come out parallel, but shifted. So the one that's up bottom left is your answer. Which of the following statements about the wave shown in the diagram is our true? P, Q, and R are in phase. Remember that phase thing that we're looking at? Right. P, and, P is heading up, Q is heading down. About to go up, about to go down. So these two are not in phase. S and T are out of phase. Yes, they are, because this is on the, at the peak up, this is at the peak down. So two is correct. Wavelength of the wave is, this, um, is distance PR. When you look at the gap between P and R, they're doing the same thing. So the distance between two consecutive points are, can be taken as a wavelength. So the answers there are one and two, which is C. Well, so sorry. That's all we have for Physics CSEC. We hope you have grasped some of the points we have discussed. You can catch a repeat of today's lesson on JNN today at 4 p.m. and in Schools Not Out highlights on Saturday between 1 and 4 p.m. We'll also be on video on demand on One Spot Media. Remember, exam starts July 13. Check the various platforms for revisions. Until next time, I am Pethon Dawkins. Up next is English Language with Arden Virtue. Stay tuned. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much. For Reduce your risk of viral illnesses like the flu and coronavirus. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water. Cover your nose and mouth when coughing with a tissue and dispose of it.